Mark Urban. Well, the man who led the military response to 9-11 was Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. I spoke to him earlier about the prosecution of the so-called war on terror, but first I asked him about his memories of that day. When the plane hit the Pentagon, what did you do? I left my office to find out what had happened. No one knew what had hit the Pentagon or what had caused the explosion uh, or the building to shake. And uh, I went, ran down the hall uh, on my floor, and as the smoke got too bad, I decided I'd better go downstairs and go outside, which I did. And I, I ran into a lieutenant colonel who had seen a plane, told me he'd seen the plane hit the Pentagon, and that's what caused the damage. And I ran around the corner and there was the smoke and the flame and the people you know, streaming out of the building burning and, and uh, it was it was shortly after it happened that I was physically there. And presumably you know people that perished. Oh my goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, you know, you, you can't ever say you're fortunate after something like that, but the plane happened to, to hit a section that was not yet fully occupied and that was reinforced. It had been part of the Pentagon that had been re, uh, rehabilitated and fixed. And it was stronger, and, and therefore we were, as I say, fortunate that the numbers weren't much larger. Do you still think about it in different... Does it come to you in strange moments, you know, that day, in flashbacks or in dreams? Oh, my goodness, yes. You, you just can't have, go through something like that and, and watch those Twin Towers or think of the people aboard that airplane that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the passengers went in and subdued the terrorists and, and saved the Capitol or the White House from being attacked as well. And people had very powerful emotions around that time, particularly of revenge. But you had to then snap to in a way, didn't you? You had to go from the person that was seeing what was happening there to your job. You were the one that had to mm -hmm. implement what was going to happen. The president called and said, um, start getting your people thinking about what, what's next for us? Because he said it's going to come to you. And um, the um, you used the word revenge. Uh, I I tried to avoid having people use that word uh, and said this isn't about retaliation or revenge. Uh, our task is to protect the American people. It's not to get even. Uh, it is to put pressure on terrorists wherever they are make everything they do more difficult, harder to talk on a phone, harder to move around from countries, harder to find a country that will be hospitable to them, and, and harder to recruit and raise money. When you uh, think of what happened to Abu Ghraib, uh, the and also the enhanced uh, interrogation techniques, and indeed some talked about it as torture and extraordinary rendition, do you think that you went too far? Well, of course, uh, you, I don't know what you mean by you, the, the Pentagon didn't do... Uh, renditions and didn't do uh, waterboarding at all. I know the world thinks the Pentagon did, but we didn't. The CIA waterboarded three people, and the director of CIA, George Tenet, and his successor, Mike Hayden, and Porter Goss, and the, the Tenet was appointed by Clinton, the other two by Bush, and then the fourth, uh, Leon Panetta, was appointed by um, President Obama have all said that the information that came from those enhanced interrogations constituted a large fraction of what we knew about Al-Qaeda and that in some instances contributed to the mosaic that led to the killing of Osama bin Laden. So um, my view is that, that the uh, people in the CIA did what the president asked them to do. They did it professionally and it benefited the information that was needed to uh, uh, tackle the, the new problem of a terrorist network like Al-Qaeda. After almost a decade, uh, the U.S. finally uh, got bin Laden. Do you think the death of bin Laden represents a moment when America can stop feeling fearful? Can stop feeling fearful? fearful about Al-Qaeda. Well, you say America as though we're distinctive. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been a lot of successful terrorist attacks around the world since September 11th. They just happen not to have been in the United States, but they've occurred in a number of other locations, other countries. No, I think that uh, Osama bin Laden uh, is replaceable and that there will be a replacement. And I think that the broader, deeper task 
is to is to weaken their fundraising support, to weaken their recruiting ability, and to persuade more people that attending uh, radical madrasas and learning how to strap suicide bombs on your body and going in and killing innocent men, women, and children is not the ought not to be your first choice in life. But is it time then to talk to this hydra-headed beast? Do you eventually need to talk to the people who are now the leaders of Al-Qaeda? Elizabeth Manning and Buller, the former MI5 leader, said uh, just this week, she said, look, in the end, I hope Western countries are talking to Al-Qaeda. The inference being that eventually you talk to the IRA, eventually talk mm -hmm. to the Taliban, because it is necessary to have that kind of solution. I, there's no question but that people have to be persuaded to not do what they're doing. If free people are going to be able to um, get up when they want and go where they want and say what they want and do what they want without fear. So if that means talking to people who are attached to Al-Qaeda, if that makes a difference, well, we, we should do it. We talk to people all over the globe and, and trying to persuade them directly and indirectly that they shouldn't be doing that. So you have no compunction about that if that in the end leads to peace? The, the, the goal has to be to compete in the battle of ideas, and their idea is a danger to them, and it's a danger to the world, and we need to be willing to confront it and to, and to talk about it and, and persuade people not to do that. If that means talking to members of al-Qaeda, so be it, the same way you have to talk to the Taliban and the IRA. Well, they're talking to the Taliban, children, yeah. yeah. So where do you think the next, you talked about the known knowns and the unknown unknowns, where do you think the next threat is coming from? When you look at Syria, Syria now we know, you know, there's people being killed in the streets, there's attacks on homes just at the other hour, you know, there is torture. What makes it any different from Libya? Well, I think that if, if you ask me coal, which is more important to the United States in our strategic interest, uh, clearly Syria is. I mean, Libya was a sideshow compared to, not to the people involved, not to the people being killed, not to the people being repressed by uh, Gaddafi, but the combination of Syria and Iran is, they're out funding terrorist networks, they're causing difficulties in Iraq, difficulties in Afghanistan, uh, they're brutal to their own people. I mean, Assad regime is a, is a vicious regime. The idea that he's a reformer is, is nonsense. Just on that very point, you said just in your speech that you tried to counsel President Bush not to call it a war on terror. I did. You thought that was wrong. I lost. He decided to call it that. And what was your argument against? Well, I think once you say the word war, the implication is that it's going to be a, a battle of bullets and tanks and airplanes. And what we're engaged in here is, is much more than that. It's, it's not going to be won by bullets. It's, it's a problem of, of a competition of ideas, a way to live lives. Uh, second, um, once you say war, the implication is that the Pentagon's going to solve it. And once you say a war on terror, what you're basically talking about, terror, is a technique. Uh, it's a method used by the enemy. They could use tanks, they could use airplanes, they could use terrorist activities. And, and you, you're not really making a war on tanks or terrorists. You're making a war on the, the people that are trying to uh, kill innocent men, women, and children. Do you think you can talk about the war in Iraq and say, well, one of the reasons that I think that it was a good thing is because it's led to the Arab Spring? Oh, goodness, I couldn't prove that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, there's no question that it's a good thing to have a country in, in that part of the world that has a constitution they fashioned, has a democratic government, is respectful of the various diverse elements, and is no longer has a vicious, vicious dictator running it, and is no longer the kind of a country that is is uh, willing to invade its neighbor like Kuwait. Or it's 6,000 U.S. personnel, 31,000 others, civilians, women, children, it was worth it. I think the world's a better place uh, with Saddam Hussein gone and with that, that but a evolving democracy in that part of the world, and I think he's right. You said, we cannot guarantee what regimes come out of Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. No one can. How it will all end up, nobody knows. Nobody knows about those countries. You can't help but be hopeful that they'll end up with freer political systems and freer economic systems, and that the young people will get jobs and opportunities. But you can't be certain of it, and, uh, and, and therefore you, you have to do what you can to try to encourage the, the people that are trying to move in the right direction and 
discourage those that are moving in the wrong direction. Thank you, John, sir. Thank you very much. Well, I'm John.